It's very much my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker from the dry west coast to the moist uh, east coast, uh, Winthrop Professor Simon Anderson, Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Visual Arts at the University of Western Australia. Simon has taught and practised architecture at the University of Western Australia, or UWA, since 1989. He has won university and national awards and citations for excellence in teaching, as well as awards, prizes and commendations for buildings and for his competition designs for residential, multi-residential, institutional and industrial buildings. He has also acted as curator of major architectural exhibitions and exhibited buildings and projects uh, internationally. I first became aware of his work through the independent Melbourne-based journal Backlog. Please join with me in welcoming Simon. Thanks very much, Andrew. Now let me just make sure we're on. We are on, so we have a title. Thank you to the University of Queensland and the State Library for inviting me to come up uh, this evening. You'll notice that there's a slight change from what you might have seen in the title. I think it, on the poster it was two pi, but in fact the, the title actually sent was two and a quarter. Now, that's fine. As long as it's not three or four, I don't think it's a problem, and I'll, perhaps we'll explain later why we have two and a quarter. Indeed, that is the point of this evening's talk, to try and actually talk about uh, whether that number is two, three, four, or nine, or some other number, or indeed two pi. What I want to do this evening is to talk a bit about uh, art, a bit about architecture in Western Australia, show you in detail probably two housing projects and then a whole lot of other housing projects, then some non-housing projects, something I'm currently doing or working on, and then finish with perhaps some conclusions or a summary or indeed a, a response to indeed this sort of rhetorical question about towards what, and I think the could be asked also answered, what does two and a quarter mean? The title comes from, I guess, two places. Firstly, Cabusio, Towards a New Architecture, late 1920s, but also from something I wrote a long time ago in Transition, which was one of the uh, journal that actually in some sense responsible for, for Backlog, a journal published by RMIT throughout the 80s and 90s. And I had written something in probably 1993 or 4 about an entry by Ashton Reg McDougall in the Museum of Victoria competition. And this is, in fact, a reproduction from the journal I scanned, I think, on the weekend and reproduced here. Uh, and somewhere in here, if you could read it, there is a discussion about dimensionality. And I... I remember at the time being quite interested in this particular submission by ARM to the competition, and it seemed to remind me about the concept of fractional dimensionality, which was very popular in the 1990s, as uh, writers and critics started to look at uh, mathematics or new mathematics or complexity theory or chaos theory, all sorts of different terms, and someone had dredged up the concept of fractional dimensionality, and so this scheme struck me as very appropriate to be discussed in terms of dimensionality. And I thought at the time, and I probably still do, that in some sense this was an interest in dimensionality. And, and for those of you who have got either very good eyes, probably don't think anyone's eyes will be able to, in here it talks a bit about what fractional dimensionality might mean. And it effectively means that a building or an object can actually, <coughs> when viewed at different distances, can in fact appear to have different dimensionality. So sometimes it can appear quite flat, sometimes it can appear highly modelled. Uh, and my interest was, in, I guess, at this stage in writing about this building to suggest that uh, these architects were exploring fractional dimensionality where rather than three or four, they were interested in 2.75 or something like that, hence 2.25, which we'll get to later. Art. You'll all know this, I hope. The Fountain from 1917, Marcel Duchamp piece. Uh, more importantly, from my point of view, it was voted, I think, in 2004 by 500 of the world's leading art historians as the most important work of art from the 20th century. 
Interestingly, the, the actual piece itself disappeared shortly after its exhibition in 1917. This is actually the Steelix photograph of the fountain, which is in fact the only way this piece has existed for many years. I think from memory Duchamp reproduced an edition of eight in, 19, in the 1950s, and there are actually, I think, eight pieces uh, that you can actually see in various places around the world. I think there's one in Philadelphia from my student days. That, uh, <coughs> and Duchamp, I think, in 53 actually reproduced this on some urinals that were reproduced or, in fact, located for him. I guess the reason I'm showing this is to try and suggest that art and architecture diverged at about 1917, from my point of view, much to... Uh, not to say for the worse, but they, in, in, in some sense, parted company. And uh, without one, he let the cat out of the bag. Then, in my view, is in some sense the path that Duchamp actually... Uh, developed or pioneered as early as 1917 is perhaps the one that architecture might wish to follow. Oh. Space, time and architecture. The, fourth, the famous fourth dimension in architecture. Gideon, 19, I think published in the early 40s, 41 or 2, lectures 38, 39 at Harvard uh, and introduced the concept of, I guess, the fourth dimension to architecture. Interestingly, he mentions only one work of art from Duchamp, and it is the nude descending the staircase. It's not the fountain. Indeed, if you read the back of this book, you'll find that Gideon thinks that the, the problem of art and architecture, the issue for art and architecture, has in fact been solved by uh, about 1928 in Cabusio's case. So he, in fact, in this work, he actually brings, attempts to bring together art and architecture and suggests that this great crusade or this great campaign for modern art and architecture, in fact, is actually solved by the late 1920s, effectively by Cabusier working on the cubism of Matisse and Picasso to produce plastic, plastic architecture. He doesn't talk about Duchamp's 1917 fountain. We'll come back to art later. Architecture in Western Australia. How many people have been to Western Australia? How many people have been to Perth? <laughs> oh, it's not bad. It's probably 10%, possibly. So I thought I might spend a little bit of time talking about architecture in Western Australia. Architecture in Western Australia is it's the end of the road. So Freeland in 68 just said, we're very late. We just get things, but we just get them later. People who had lived and worked their whole entire lives in Western Australia, like... John White, Margaret Morrison. Margaret Morrison, the first woman architect registered in Western Australia in 1929 or 30. John White, a still living, pioneering modern architect from the 1950s and indeed teacher at UWA where I currently work. When they compiled a, a book about Western Australian architecture in the 1970s for the sesquicentenary, 1979, they actually didn't even talk about architecture. Look, towns, buildings, there's no architecture skyscraper, first building, roundhouse, Henry Reevely, based on effective, uh, reported by many to be based on some designs his father had done from Jeremy Bentham, little tiny prison in, in Fremantle. Later, in the 80s, architecture in a guidebook is all its style, its spectacle. Hepburn, in the, back in the 50s, had with Stevenson, had actually produced a, a sort of a master plan for Perth. And, I, and Dean, it struck, struck me today, and I did put this slide together today, when I was walking around the river of Brisbane, and this afternoon I went for a walk around this little river, it struck me that nothing had much changed since I last did that walk, I think in 1983 or 4, as a student of architecture. Things happen very slowly in cities. Deja Vu, a very seminal article in West Australian history, architectural history, had been written by Marcus Collins in the 1980s. No words, just pictures. We actually took the trouble to identify West Australian buildings and other buildings around the world at the time. And indeed, from memory, the ones on the right are in West Australia. They are. The ones on the left are in the United States. And he produced a pictorial essay of uh, this coming together of, I guess, modernism and local practice. Earlier, 
people like Beasley had actually looked again closely at the sort of buildings that exist in Perth, the sort of buildings that existed in the Illustrated London News at the time, indeed earlier. Various artists at, on the right had imagined Perth as some sort of metropolis by grossly exaggerating the scale of Perth in an attempt to sort of convey some sort of metropolitanism, where architects on the left had in fact uh, done the reverse, where they had in fact made miniatures of then significant buildings from other parts of the world, in this case the Chicago Tribune. Oh, back to artists. In the 1970s, some people like Paul Thomas and Alan Vincennes were having a, having a look at, in fact, the reality of West Australian architecture, which is indeed the house on the the top of the screen where one has the uh, rolling out of general housing across a sand plain uh, which forms the sort of basis of Perth's metropolitan system developed by Stevenson and Hepburn where one spreads across the, the sand uh, to the north, to the south, along the coast. One stays, stays away from the, the hills and the valleys to the, to the east which are, are difficult to in fact to build upon. And but more recently, people like Bolton and others have actually, they see art, art and landscape as, in fact, the new black. So what, there's an uh, interest very recently in, in imagining West Australia uh, in, a, in a, uh, an artistic and, and a, in some sense, a, a response to its particular environment. Now, if time is relative, so is space. I always like showing this slide. This is a Texan's view of the world, which I'm found a long time ago, and I continue to use it. The, uh, someone from Texas imagines that's the, the real size of Texas. I, I'd like to see what a Queenslander might think or a West Australian might think. But in some sense, West Australian space and time is, I guess, a subplot from what I'm trying to talk about today, where one has a, a very particular set of uh, spatial and historical circumstances that certainly leads to to my work and probably leads, I hope, to an understanding of the work of, of others in Western Australia. Buildings in West Australia, I mean, it is the most dif diffuse capital city. There's hardly any buildings. They are a long way apart. It is very diffuse. It is by far the most diffused urban conglomeration in the world in terms of the number of people, the number of buildings that occupy a particular amount of space. There is far more outside space than inside space, but it, and it's actually getting more extreme as it diffuses continuously. So I'm quite fond of this particular building. It was a prison built for indigenous, indigenous uh, inhabitants in, on an island of, a little penal island off the coast of Western Australia called Rottnest, and it was built by a jailer from the original uh, prison that we saw on the front of the Western Towns and Buildings, a little little small panoptic prison that was done by Reevely. His jailer then went to Rottnest, 20 miles across the water from Perth, and then built the prison for Indigenous recalcitrants at the time, and he managed to actually uh, string out this remarkable composition around this rather large courtyard for uh, the benefit of the inhabitants. It actually became, and still is, a holiday resort. And indeed, I was always struck, and still are struck, by the fact that the penal institutions of West Australia are actually, make, make, in some sense, just as good holiday uh, resorts as they do prisons. This is actually a very, a very fashionable holiday resort where you stay in a little cell. Freeland, if you remember your architectural history... Freeland always talked about, and Freeman and others in it talked about superficiality as one of the problems of architecture in Australia. We are superficial. Well, in West Australia, we're very superficial because we're actually a lot later and a lot weaker. So we actually do things like this. And this is in a, a cathedral in the town of New Norcia, 150 kilometres northeast of Perth, where, I'm being a bit cheeky, there's in fact a, there is a facade at the front which is actually about this thick. And then the rest of it is actually just painted on the local paper, painted on the stonework. And to my mind, it is in fact probably the, one of the most important uh, pieces of heritage in Western Australia. Now, this sense of being, there being very little inside and all this outside, I, you can find in 
constantly in the work of architects in Western Australia. This is actually a high school from the 1950s by Gordon Finn. I've done a lot of work exhibiting architecture from West Australian architects from the 1950s to the present day, meaning they're still alive. This one's not. He passed away just after we did the exhibition. I think that's one of the unfortunate consequences of exhibiting the work of, of uh, modern architects. They tend to sort of pass away just after you do them. So, so far, I think I've had about four who have actually passed away shortly after we've done these retrospective shows. So unfortunately, Gordon Finn did pass away but, uh, afterwards. But Gordon actually laid out for the government, he was a government architect, a, very, a number of high schools in the, 19, in the 1950s, which had this enormous quality that goes on forever, with these enormous sort of open spaces. Is he, so, so is that Armadale? That's, that's Armadale. Yes, did you go there? No? Well, it's still there. Uh, other people like <coughs> Ron Ferguson at the University of Western Australia, who, who's been working on this particular campus for 48, 50 years, and has produced probably 20 or 30 major buildings, uh, has, has in some sense has been attempting to try and define... Oh, sorry, that's the wrong pointer. Define these sort of major spaces as he works with insides, outsides, and insides again as a, as a series of endeavours to try and, in fact, uh, define and create a relationship between this vast outside and what little inside there is. Perth had also, or West Australia's had a lot of great plans, great visions for things like suites of public buildings like this. We're in one today. Queensland's actually managed to do it. You've managed to get them all in a line. You've got a modern art gallery, you've got a state library, you've got a museum, you've got an art gallery, you've got a performing arts gallery. You've got that. You've managed to do that. This was Temple Pool in 1911. We, we didn't do that because, in fact, there's a railway through there, so we, didn't, we left the railway and then uh, put markets there. Another scheme, Parliament, we actually built that. Competition in the 1960s to, in fact, reorganise government in Western Australia by adding, putting all the government tenants, departments, in one complex next to Parliament. They managed to do that one. Again, Gordon Finn, the same architect I was speaking of earlier. So I guess, I guess the, another similar point, which is kind of just getting started. It seems to me that architecture and urban design, building the cities, it takes a long time. We're just getting going in this country. And indeed, I'm quite happy to say that, look, we got here before you by the look of it, <laughs> according to this particular... And it's a struggle. Again, a, a housing scheme by Julius Ellisher, a West Australian modern architect, again, passed away just after an exhibition on his life's work, where he uh, was endeavouring to develop a, a sort of a way of building in a, what you would call a sort of a fringe condition of Perth, where la slightly larger land holdings, but endeavouring to try and make sense of occupying relatively large areas of, you know, tens and twenty acres with effectively single houses in the 1970s. Very recent, a lot of if you, for those of you who know the work of Peter Corrigan, at the same time was actually working on some similar projects, probably slightly further out of Melbourne, this is of Perth, where the issue seems to me one of how you actually put a single residence in a vast space. And there's a sense to try, and in, in the case of, of Julius, to try and enclose or contain or develop some sort of a territory which is uh, relatively contained or be able to be, in fact, even be managed, mown with a lawnmower, animals kept out, fires kept out. But again, it's hard work here because, you know, we don't have the luxury of lack of space where you can, in fact, close the loop. So you end up getting these sorts of things that tend to sort of struggle to capture this space and then you need to, in fact, put a wall around it to actually finish off the outside. But I'm happy to say things are getting faster, things are moving ahead and while they're doing that there's, very little, there's still very little architecture if you look at West, the West Australian political economy there is very little work done by architects, there's very little things you've talked about, you could even imagine this architecture the economic boom is driven by these, sort, these, sorts, of, these sorts of things, although West Australia is talked about as having a, a remarkably affluent economy and it is, 
you know, coffee's like five or six dollars and you can't find anybody to do anything for you. And the last story that hit the local airwaves, sound waves, was the case of a laundry hand on one of these things who, who gets paid $300,000 a year to, to wash the sheets on one of those. It used to be the $100,000 to drive the truck. It's now $300,000 to wash the sheets on one of those. So I'm incredibly... Uh, well, when I come to Brisbane, I've just noticed there's so many people here who want to do things for you, whereas in West Australia, there's nobody who will do anything for you because they're all up here getting paid $300,000 to wash sheets. Now, this is most of the work, most of the activity, most of the economies in places like this. this is, in fact, this is Port Hedland today. Well, that's actually photos probably three years old by a, a photographer, I can't remember his name, Martin Mustakowitz or an artist and a photographer who published a book of photographs of mostly West Australia, parts of South Australia, bits of the Northern Territory, with a, a Ford by Tim Winton. But this is, in fact, for those of you who haven't been to the Pilbara, this is the reality of the boom in Western Australia. This is, in fact, where you get to be if you are earning $300,000 a year. A house there, you know, I don't know, there's no houses there, but, you know, I don't know, a million dollars, one and a half renting for $5,000 a week. And this is night time. Now, this is the boom in Western Australia. While that's been going on, architecture exists in the suburbs and it exists on the beaches up and down the coast. West Australia is actually slowly becoming in a, uh, a set of tourist destinations or beach resorts or holiday resorts along a coastline of 11,000 or 12,000 kilometres. I think I did a calculation when I was writing something some years ago to work out how much coastline you get. In West Australia, you still get, I think, 12 metres of coastline for everybody. Like every person can get 12 metres. If you divide you know, 12,000 kilometres by the population, you all get 11 or 12 metres. I think, it, I think it did a comparison for New South Wales. I think in New South Wales you get three... 297 millimetres or something like that. So, in some sense, West Australia is about trying to... Under, we have to understand the sense of you know, open space, a political economy that means you can't build... Well, it's very hard to build anything unless you have the amounts of money that would pay labourers $300,000 a year. A friend of mine, an architect, commonly talks about... Again, his version of this story is a... House, a house renovation, young architect, house renovation, the tiler d drives a Mercedes 500 SEL and puts the tiles in the boot. So we are li West Australia is in fact a very unusual place at the moment that it does in fact have a combination of enormous amounts of space, no people, and extraordinarily high cost of living and wages, wage bills. Very difficult to be an architect in a place like that. Unless, and this is a house from Ivan Ivanov in the 1970s, where you uh, are able to, in fact, ring out uh, a house by the coast for people who, at that stage, this particular client was in the mining industry, a previous version of the same story, 1970s, the nickel boom. Now, in the 1980s, 1990s, Perth's got lots of buildings like this. This is my, probably my favourite colonial building by uh, Dennis Silva, where you have a remarkable uh, ability by <laughs> architects and their clients to produce buildings of an exceptionally uh, reduced palette. I like to call it it's sort of the latest late modern, if those of you can remember Charles Jenks, one of his more seminal books, I think called Late Modern Architecture. He talked about a particular moment in modernism where at the end of modernism you get this reduction of uh, palette and form to very, very little. I can't remember the names of the protagonists, people like John Burgey and Philip Johnson at that stage in, in uh, Texas. So we have in Perth, in some, some sense, the latest late modernism that you can find. Somewhere else I'd actually tried to, under, try to explain in a sentence how one would describe the sort of architecture you get from a place like Western Australia where you have vast amounts of space, uh, a, a very difficult 
political economy to build in a, a very a very severe climate in the sense that it's the, the highest intensity of solar radiation in the, in the world exists in a big circle over the southwest of Western Australia. So you, in some sense, you end up with, in, in my opinion, when I was writing this, a, a place that favours an expansive, fleeting, robust, approximate architecture, which seems a bit, a bit uh, pretentious now when I read it <laughs> as a sentence. But in some sense, this story does go on. Now, Ash and Reagan McDougall, we spoke about earlier, in the 1990s were doing competitions for museums that were unrealised, are now getting to build extensions of those competitions. This building is almost, well, it's, it's probably half finished, uh, where you get this remarkable, remarkable expression of, uh, of form. Oh. And... Ashton Rigg McDougall, as lead designers, are currently working on recreating, in fact, this sort of foreshore experience at the heart of the city of Perth, where uh, the water is actually brought in. We're going to end up with a, a lot of cafes, boats, dinghies. A new teaching hospital currently being, being finished in the southern suburbs of Perth as a part of a rationalisation of the medical system of the city and the state where we see, again, the triumph of things that Perth is based on, cars and trees. And in the city, we are over the top of the railway station. If you remember the earlier slide of the Temple Pool scheme for the city of Perth, this was, on Temple Pool's mind, a perfect place to build art gallery, museum, library down through the centre of the city. It's taken almost, well, taken almost 100 years. It's taken over 100 years to, in fact, sink a piece of a railway about this much of it, and in fact, put in place this scheme. And you can see what it's going to look like. It actually reminds me of Gray Street. I've just been, and I've been, here for, I've been here for 24 hours, so it seems to me this is the future of, looks like Gray Street on, a, on uh, Christmas Eve. So we'll come back later to, to West Australia architecture and its future later. I wanted to now show you a couple of houses which I've just, well more recent houses, and I'll show you some old houses, and I'll show you some other things. I've done a lot of houses. I think all architects do a lot of houses in my position. Most of my life has been involved in teaching young students and uh, doing other things, bits and pieces, but I have done a lot of houses. So this is a, a pair of houses in a suburb of Mount Lawley, an inner city heritage suburb. So it's typically full of, surprisingly heritage reproductions and, I guess, little houses by other young architects behind real heritage houses. This is a house or houses for a particular couple who uh, had a, were for, very fortunate to acquire a block of land. They could build two houses. So we bid, did build them two houses, but we actually uh, allowed them to live in it as one. So like many self-employed artists. They were very interested in their future as their children were growing up and they didn't have any superannuation, unlike me who works in the university, so I have plenty of superannuation. So they were very interested in notions of uh, time of life and being able to look after themselves. So we designed and built two houses for them. Now they lived in this and they do live in it as one large house. So they now have, this is, this is actually one house here, there's one house here, and so downstairs they have the parents sort of live over here, they have a garage and they have a sort of a studio, the, the boy and the girl are there, and the, and the parents live there when they visit from their country state, as most people do when they get towards their that time of life, they buy a bit of land out of town, and they, in this case they grow olives, or is it wine, or is it both, something like that. I'm sure that happens here too. And upstairs, they then have a sort of a family kitchen. There's a living room there. There's two terraces on top of the cars there. And then there's a sort of a TV area for the kids and a bit of a, a work area for the kids. There. The houses were built out of... Uh, well, first of all, they were built in an exceptionally precious area of the city's heritage, uh, in the heritage protected area. So it took an enormous amount of negotiation with the council to convince them that this was reasonable. And there was an enormous backlash against it. In some sense, the modulation of the buildings is entirely in response to their sense of what buildings should be in these parts of the city. So they, 
were required to have differential setbacks for everything, so the sense one had to, in fact, uh, contort these houses to comply with some sense of, I guess, a sort of pictorial, a pictorial streetscape in a heritage area. They were built out of concrete panels on site, which is indeed a, 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 a very uh, rudimentary way of making walls in Western Australia. When you have uh, uh, large amounts of sand pads, you can just pour these panels on site and they stand them up. The photographer then was managed to take some photographs before the place was occupied so that you don't see any of the real activity of these houses. And then this is, in fact, what the houses really ended up being like. And you can see they put all their, their things inside them. And, these com and this is their bedroom. And then there's the cat. Unfortunately, the cat's died too. And then they live in the, these panel houses. Now... My interest, I guess, at this stage was actually trying to produce, I guess, two things, a house that people could actually live in uh, and these, you know, in a way that would actually maximise their uh, life circumstances. Since these houses were finished a couple of years ago, unfortunately, well, the cat's died. Also, uh, the father has died, so then the son's fighting with the mother about the olive grove and the orchard up, and the, uh, the vineyard up in the country and the children have left home. One of them's gone to Melbourne. I think one might be at home. So, which is a way of saying, despite all the best lays plans, uh, you might end up with uh, a different result. Nevertheless, they've since actually done what they were intending to do, much more quicker than I thought. They've actually now bricked up the hole between the two houses and rented this house to a young lawyer who's just returned from working in London, so he can then pay them a, a very nice, hefty rent, while... The, the three people left, left in the house actually live in, in this house with the daughter in Melbourne and the mother-in-law not speaking to the son and then the father dead and the cat dead. So in, in some sense, it's been, it's been actually a great result. And it's actually, they are my, by far my most complimentary clients in a sense because it's in fact exactly what, uh, exactly what we planned is actually eventuated, albeit perhaps too quickly than we would have wanted now, this is the more recent house that I've just finished. This is what the other house was supposed to look like. This is, in fact, one house. This is what I wanted to do in the first house, but unfortunately it was in a zone that was highly controlled by uh, the council in terms of heritage. I'm very lucky. This is actually almost part of the University of Western Australia. And it's, it's directly opposite a substation and next to the university, so it's actually considered to have no heritage value whatsoever as a precinct. It's actually in the, in the, in the next shire, from the, almost next door to the shire that the first was in, so this shire was, in fact, not interested in what these buildings look like because this area is surrounded by students, universities, substations, which I think is a, a very good thing to recommend to potential buyers to try and, try and find a place to buy where there aren't any controls or people don't value things very highly. So this actually is a house for a, a three generations of a academic family. There are a academic couple in who are actually living up in here and they have some children and one of them lives in, well, they have bedrooms there. There's a studio down there for the university age student and then there's an apartment down here for their, their parents who spend half their time in Malaysia and half their time in Perth. I was only allowed to have two cars on the site because this particular shire thinks she can't, you shouldn't be allowed to have more cars, even though there is no car is in a university. This particular house. So, the first game I did actually had almost all cars here, and uh, but it was thought to be unsightly for an area which is covered with cars. But that's another story. Again, the similar concept: tilt-up panels, three sizes, poured on site, so you can only have a stack of panels this high. For those of you who understand, well, have seen the back of a concrete truck, you can only pour about this many panels out of a concrete truck on, onto sand. So we can have, you can have five, you can have 15 panels in a house. So we had a small pile. When I say small, it's a narrow panel. I think that's the narrow one, that's the medium one, that's the large one. So we had three stacks of panels. Then you just arrange them in, in order so you can actually accommodate the needs of the program. And then you put the house up in a day, the panels, and then you then have to then finish it off, which takes a bit longer, but not much. This is what the house, well, you can see in some sense the, 
the detailing of the house is much closer to the things that I was attempting to do in, in the earlier house, where one is able to have effectively one contractor produce most of the house. In terms of a, a building economy in West Australia, uh, a group of, there are, well, grano workers, mostly of European descent, control industry, and they've, gone, they've now managed to, in fact, deliver a very comprehensive service where one trade will, in fact, be able to, in fact, uh, produce the concrete in the ground, pour, pour the panels, pour the slab, stand the panels up, and walk away. So one contractor can, in fact, do that. Then the other great West Australian trade, as you can imagine from the oil rigs, is, in fact, steel fabrication. So steel fabricators are then able to put on the roof, uh, put on the wall frames, frame up the entire inside, clad the outside, clad the inside. So sort of two trades, you can actually end up with a complete finished product. And also the, the steel workers, then they do the, they do the clip on the sun shading as well. I'm happy to say that that detail I saw in some outside the airport last night, I was quite pleased. I've never, I rarely go anywhere and see some details <laughs> or something that I would actually do myself in a, in a public space. And there's some little temporary, I think they're temporary bus shelters or tra taxi shelters outside the Brisbane airport, which are a bit like this. And I, was, I have to say I was quite chuffed to see, for once, something that uh, I might have done in a place like that. The back of the house is the front, there's the front door. Inside, again, the photographer takes photos like this, gets the doors to swing so you don't see anything, but, but then we have to go, so this is what photographers do, and then later on, these clients are much more tasteful, so they actually buy reproduction furniture from China, as they do buy most of those things from various interesting places, which I, I speak about with them occasionally. Apparently, there's, there's a street in Hong Kong which sells marvellous sort of taps and and bits and pieces, and there's another street in Hong Kong that sells reproduction modern furniture. So this house is full of little things that the, the clients, who are Chinese descent, would actually bring back from their ventures uh, in, uh, in Asia. And so the, the client was uh, very, as well as building his own sort of old-fashioned stereo with valves and speakers, he actually also made his bed out of bits from Bunnings. So I think these are some sort of trusses he found at Bunnings to make his own bed, which I thought was, was fabulous. He's actually... a a political economist by training. And he actually made that table out of some bits and pieces. And Ikea made the kitchen. And then I think they bought most of the art. I think it might be from a repro reproduction art website. There's, there's the house, which was erected in, erected in sort of five hours. The plan is very straightforward. Uh, so there's a little apartment down in here, some cars, a studio and a storeroom. And upstairs... Well, it's the same again. And upstairs we have the parents, full of big living room, a couple of kids in the end, and then the elevation, things like that. It's unfortunately being very badly received by the press in the, in the community. It's been very badly received by the university I work for, who actually owns uh, most, of the, most of the area, and indeed the university's staff architect without knowing I built the building, spent, must have spent sort of 20 minutes telling me how shocking this thing was. <laughs> and he's, luckily he's retired, so I didn't bother telling him that it, actually it was something that I'd done. So I wanted to quickly run through a lot of old houses to try and then get back to, I guess, the topic or the question for tonight, which is two, three, four, two and a quarter, two pi. I've done a lot of, as I said, a lot of houses. This is, I guess, the first house I ever did a long time ago. Uh, which ended up being, for me, revisited in a Venice Biennale a few years ago where it was selected for, for exhibit. It, that's a very recent photograph of, of the particular house. I don't live there anymore. I haven't lived there for 15 years or more. And that's the bit I like, the air conditioner. The fact that they've managed to stick it, they've just put an air conditioner in there to make the thing inhabitable. I guess at the time, and again through revisiting this through its second life at Venice, or in that catalogue particularly, maybe think about it. Again, Paul Carter, I can't remember the origin, I remember he wrote a fabulous essay about domestic velocity quotients, where he talked about domestic space as, uh, in a sense, of trying to work at how you can do spaces that just don't require 
maintenance or looking after or trimming the hedges or cleaning the windows. And so uh, I can remember at the time being enamoured with Carter's work. I can remember the road to Botany Bay and then some of that work just after that. Uh, this house is, I can, well, I can attest to after revisiting it after 15 years, hasn't changed one iota. And then in that time, uh, it has in fact been rented continuously to various student anarchist groups who would have, the anarchists particularly, had probably 20 people living there at one stage in the, in the 1990s. And it, the house, in some sense, hasn't suffered one, one uh, iota from having that sort of robust occupation over that period of time. The bathroom is, in some sense, designed like a, an ablution block. I, I guess I still have to, would say that, to, to my mind, the best bathroom is the uh, ablution block on the, you know, the open-air ablution block at the beach. The concrete panel house I showed you for the academics, the first scheme that I attempted to convince them on was to have a boys' bathroom and a girls' bathroom, which were, in fact, somehow like that. But then they had to have... One of, one of, someone had to have an Alessi toilet and so that then drove us down the path of uh, the white goods that prevented me from doing that. I guess in my work as a, a young academic, I always got, got students in the early days of their architecture courses to photograph exactly how they live. This is in fact, and I was always amazed at the sort of, you know, if you just go home, take a photograph of how you really live, not how you see that in the magazines or the books, how you really live, and I would get astounding photographs back to show how people live. And one day, when I've got no architectural work, I'd like to actually kind of try and do that with a photographer. Who I've been working, well, I can show you his house later that I've been working with for a long time, actually try and really understand how people do live in spaces. This is, in fact, that first house where it had a brick staircase and, yeah, and the anarchist eventually got into it and, and it still looks exactly the same. After that, I did a, a little house for my ageing mother, which was, again, in a very, very strict heritage control area where we had to actually sort of make the house kind of look like it was really... make the house kind of look very plain and simple and gabled roof, but in fact it was not quite like that. Uh, I was very... And I guess typically of work like that, the thing that was supposed to look like has been knocked down, and now this thing sits there completely out of place, which I guess in some sense is a vindication of... The, uh, I guess my belief that you know, heritage controls, heritage laws have, have little value and that one should really just let value be ascribed through uh, almost a process of natural selection. This is the house I did for the photographer who's taken all the photographs. Like they are, I, I've done, I did this house for him a long time ago where it was uh, attempted to sort of capture some views and frame views to, to a particular side. I'm very happy. I found a building in Fitzroy about 10 years ago that actually was remarkably similar. So again, although one likes to think of one's ideas as being the latest and the greatest, I'm, a, I'm actually much happier when I find things that other people have done before that are the same. A house out in, in the country I, I did for myself. This is my uh, holiday house, and you know, an hour away with a bit of land around uh, so I can get away from, get away from living in the city. And then I started to get a lot of work doing bigger houses for people from business or accounting or law, where, I, again, I attempted it within the confines of a relatively traditional uh, client and budget and brief to uh, express some of that continuity of residential architecture. By the early 2000s, I was starting to get another range of clients who were very interested in building... Uh, low-cost, affordable housing, usually from fractured family circumstances. So I did a scheme for a thing for a, called the, I think I called it the Blank House for a, a, a single aunt of a friend of mine. We were, again, in a rural location where I first started to play with panelised construction. And then various contorted versions of uh, traditional housing models that would be required to fit into strange, zoned, heritage inner city, bourgeois, middle class, all the things that drive most of architects' lives. So this particular house was for a, uh, I think a, te a television producer, obviously at the ABC, because they came from an architect, to actually have them design a, a little house that actually had to then be shaped heavily to fit the particular... Uh, particular sort of solar controls that are now so evident in, in West Australian planning 
and indeed the house inside was uh, an attempt to try and to uh, then, well, develop some spaces that were in some sense all over and uh, figured strongly by the, the external pressures on the particular house. I did a lot of houses, for, again, for, in this case, I'm happy to say, didn't proceed for a sort of business, business people out in the country, but I did start to appreciate the difficulties of, of uh, building in vast, open spaces, in, in this case, a highly sensitive and also bushfire-prone area. Lots of house additions like these, where I guess the interest was to try and, in those sorts of uh, affluent suburbs where there is enormous tree canopies and, in fact, uh, sort of an emerging ecological pattern to try and actually not intervene too much. It seems to me that a lot of those middle suburbs that have uh, traditionally had very large yards, there are now very significant tree plantings and uh, bird life and all sorts of good reasons where that's actually the valuable part of the site. So this house actually sort of wrapped around wrapped around all these existing, that's an existing Jarrah tree, the famous sort of West Australian indigenous tree that in fact was endemic to the entire coastal plain. And this house sort of wraps around and creates this sort of effectively a whole series of sort of, you know, shadowed light spaces at various times of the year. I wanted to put a melanoma on the roof. Again, if you remember, sun, uh, again, part of Federation architecture had the sunburst roof where you had the sort of sun the sunlight on the roof where you would have in the sense of the sunburst. Well, in, indeed, I thought, given uh, the incidence of sort of skin cancer, in, in particularly in my, myself, my wife, and probably my children, certainly my parents, but also uh, most West, or many West Australians, I thought that would be an appropriate way to reinterpret the sun. I then did a whole lot of schemes, various schemes for uh, people to, who actually occupying land outside of the metropolitan area of Perth. This is indeed a house for a house for a, a student's, a former student of mine, her parents. Unfortunately, he died of cancer. So that one never got, actually got built. This one is, again, a little, again, a little house in a very affluent beachside suburb, well, not suburb, beachside town on, near Margaret River where we were trying to do a sort of, a, again, work at how you build for a single, a single man who works on oil rigs only there occasionally, and then the, the only available, the available land holdings are always massive. They're always a problem, fire breaks, rain, vandalism, if you're on their occasion. So try to develop a sort of a house like this that actually wrapped around a, a, wrapped around a sort of a courtyard and so you could leave, in fact, the entire site completely untouched and indeed sort of just have this little thing here where you enter into a courtyard and you circulate around. And again, there's never enough, there's never enough house to go around. So unlike... Roy Grounds or Michael Markham or all sorts of architects who have built courtyard houses where you can actually get all the way around in West Australia. I can never get them to go around, partly because I, I think there's a sense we don't want that to be too small because, in fact, there's just a, you know, this enormous amounts of you know, open space to actually struggle with. And then versions of houses on smaller blocks in, in the city where we're playing with, in this case, I was endeavouring to play with a house that is made up of really four bed sitting rooms. Again, a, a case of a three generational family where rather than design a house as kitchen, dining, living, and bedrooms, we ended up with you know, one bed sitting room, another one there, there's another one there, there's another one under there. So you end up with a family of three or three, in this case, three generations I, that actually could occupy a, a single house comfortably in a dignity. Larger housing projects, I actually. I've done quite a lot of competitions. I think this one I got a second prize in for, a large housing scheme in the inner city, which, uh, again, is part of an affordable housing issue. The, the government wanted to encourage diversity in housing. Most submissions to this competition meant, div, took it to mean diversity in architecture. So we had buildings or schemes that had a tower here and a block here and a courtyard here, whereas to my mind, to my, my response was that what a place like Northbridge, and this probably means in Queensland, a place like dot, 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 means for affordable housing, you actually need people who can afford to live there. It's not about providing diversity in the housing stock, it's actually about providing diversity in the population, and the population you're trying to cater for haven't got any money, therefore you've got to provide some effectively uh, affordable housing. So this was actually an apartment, a very uh, mean apartment building, and where uh, 
we f I think from memory there was, I don't know, 150 little apartments ranging from uh, little bed sitting rooms to one or two bedrooms apartments that actually was sort of shoehorned into this site over the top of a massive car park because of, in fact car parking is a, a big issue in a place like Perth where there is effectively no means of getting around the city other than, than private vehicles. And so it was a very much a, an, well there was a piece, there was actually a required, that thing was required to be kept so rather than doing much with it we just built over it and so we could fit in more of these sort of apartments for uh, single, effectively single men at the back and then uh, sponsored government housing at the front. I then did a, again in terms of housing, we did a, a book called Take Seven with Geoffrey Lano, I believe is coming to speak in a couple of weeks, where we looked at architectures, or architecture's contribution to general housing around Australia, inspired a bit by Rick Laplastre, who when he won a gold medal from the Institute of Architects actually spoke at length in, the, in a radio interview about wouldn't it be great in housing if rather than actually say you can build you know, a 300 square metre house or a 500 square metre house or, you know... Certainly, West Australia, uh, the standard new houses are, I don't know, four, five hundred, six hundred square metres. Or there's people, plenty of stuff way over a thousand. So, R Richard's idea was we could build lots of, rather than doing that, we could build lots of little houses. So, we thought, well, little courtyard houses, so you could have one house on each corner. So, in some sense, the multi generational uh, house, albeit, in Rich's case, very, very small. There's the contributors, and there's a couple from Queensland, which I won't talk about. But I wanted to show you what I ended up working on. Again, it's the same concept of. Uh, prototypes for a series of houses. There was a, a four-storey row house made of freestanding 12-metre-high concrete, concrete panels and then uh, four storeys and then there was various versions where you could, in fact, chop the thing up in any way you imagine. So you ended up with a, a, effectively an enormously flexible, really a, a Sydney terrace house in reverse. That's what it ended up looking like, which is a bit grim, I have to say, but then that's probably the point. Then I did a rural version where uh, you might want to then do a, a, a long low house. There it is. This one looks more palatable, I guess, to even. And then I tried which I thought was the one that interested me the most. If one had to build a, a house in a suburban environment of, you know, Typical Perth house size, 350 square, three 350 square metres, family house. How would one do it? On a, you know, 800 square metre block. This is, in fact, the bread and butter, the 4 by 2 it's called. The, four, the bread and butter of Australian housing. How would one do it? And so this is, in fact, what, how, I would in, how I would, in fact, do it. The, the person who actually drew this, the thing I'm most, well, the person who drew this for me, the thing she's most proud about is actually getting the, uh, these, this screen. Do you have these things here? these privacy screens where you can get your fence, you crib your fence from 1.8 to 2.1 as part of this sort of way of maximising your claim to, to land. So this was in fact a, a version of, I guess, the factory house, which was a precursor, I guess, to the thing I, things I've finally been managed to, managed to build. I did a whole lot of very, very modest houses for uh, single mothers. This one actually was good. 127 was too much, so I did one for 99 for her, and that was too much, so she went and bought a kit home. <laughs> so I guess I just show this to, as a way of, uh, I guess, uh, I guess a way of, you know, talking, of, sorry, let me, talking about some of the, the numbers that architects don't often talk about, it, what things really cost. I mean, one thing architects, I can assure you, never talk about is actually the real cost of, of, of buildings. So this is what I've learned about housing after all this amount of time. We don't, I don't do that. I do this. I'm very interested in, through my study of someone like Krantz and Sheldon, a, a group of Perth architects who over, a, you know, over 50 years or so built hundreds of apartment buildings, probably, I don't know, a thousand apartment buildings. God knows how many houses in them. And they actually, there, there's a whole, so there's a whole street of them at one stage. They built, you know, they used to do this. They actually managed to understand the delivery of housing so well they would actually, and through no, through no uh, malevolence, they would actually be able to uh, build house after house after house. I guess I learned about complying. I think everything I've ever done has in some sense been about complying, actually trying to find a way one can in fact build what one wishes within a, a particular political, social, local government context. 
again taught by Geoffrey Howlett, one of those architects who did the exhibition on it since died, who actually always prided himself on actually, as an architect, being able to, in fact, uh, work within a, a, a particular circumstance to achieve an outcome. Practice, there you go, Kratz and Sheldon. Practice, practice, practice makes perfect. We know about that. Housing's about that sort of stuff. We should build houses like factories. And these are, the, again, it's probably apparent from what I've said earlier, these are the sorts of clients that I have, and I'm sure this is the sorts of clients that are the real world's made of. I don't think I've ever done a house for a client who wanted... I don't think I've ever done a house for anybody who actually was two parents with two kids who had the two couches lining up with the big telly, okay? Every time I've, done, every time I've got near one of those, someone's died, divorced, grown up, changed. And so this is, in fact, the reality for housing. No waste, no art, no detail. One-page working drawings. 19th century, it was easy to do one-page working drawings. It's, easy. it's still easy. Again, Geoffrey Hallett, one-page working drawings for four apartments, or four, a little, four little tiny apartments recently. Not housing. I guess other things besides that. Cosmology galleries. I've done these sorts of buildings for, again, for scientists to actually, uh, part of their sort of scientific work to grapple with what art and science have to say about each other. So this was a, a large, a large uh, empty space, really. The problem with the scientists is they've got all the money and they like to talk about art, but they actually don't know what to put up. They actually don't know how to, to do it. So that we, we built this thing for them and they couldn't, find, they couldn't work out how to get much on the walls. <laughs> uh, sound, little sound shells for little local communities. I went back and had a look at some of the things I've done a long time ago. I remember way back I did a... Uh, a competition for Mary, I think for Mary McKillop. Probably got time to talk about it anyway. So the issue I was quite, again, in review by putting these slides together, I found these things where, again, it was about trying to build, have a building that actually would be, have differently, would have very different understandings depending on how you look at it. So from the street, if you know Panola, anyone been to Panola? Anyway, so this, Mary McKillop, Little, that's a little schoolhouse. There's a big church in here. This was a sort of a... I won't talk about This is the building. It's an interpretive centre. So, again, it has a... Uh, it has a... If I can go to, very quickly. It has a very much a, a plan which is sort of pushed, pushed out of uh, like a cookie cutter. And then on that is actually a, a bastard... There's a, there's sort of a bastard hip for those of you who... Remember, you, there's a bastard hip through there. And it has a very sort of bestial section, in some sense, with this sort of great big building engulfing another building. And again, if you again remember the 1990s, the Catholic Church at that time was in, as it should have been, in a great deal of trouble for various indiscretions by, in particular, Catholic, the Catholic brothers on, a, on particular young boys. And so, in some sense, it was my response to actually, I guess, try and comment upon the fact that the, the church, uh, the church is... Uh, you know, I guess social practices were less than desirable. And it also had, I'm happy to say, almost a flying nun quality to it. And that will pretty much mean sense to make much sense to many people, especially about my age, and that Sally Field, in the, her, I guess, greatest role as an actress, in the flying nun used to sort of have a sort of a headdress that looked a bit like that. I guess I've done things for competitions for Venice where... Uh, this is a particular one in 2008 where the, the, the job was to try and actually in a little tiny, it had to be one kilogram of something or other, it could only be this big, to actually sort of make some sort of comment about the state of architecture, where I uh, got a, a kilo of balsa wood and me and the kids stuck it together around the kitchen table one night to actually, in some sense, uh, talk a bit about architecture as an assembly of, one would think, one would hope, very similar things, but to try and to achieve some sort of a, Variety. I did a, the Venice Biennale, you know, the Venice Pavilion for D'Astasio, a competition in 2008, where one had to imagine replacing Philip Cox's Venice Biennale Pavilion. If you get a, you get a chance to find it again, Philip Cox's comments on the production of this building are, are fabulous. And I, had a, I actually I had, a, in some sense, after reading Philip's, uh, Philip's saga of how this building was built, I have enormous admiration for Philip after reading, reading what he went through to produce that. This is, I guess, what we came up with, where we, in some sense, 
well, I haven't got time to go through it, we ended up with this sort of upside down version of Philip Cox's building in black where uh, you then arrived, you arrived uh, on the plan, we can probably get to, there's a sort of a, a big slab of, I think, marble and there's a fireplace here, but it's more, it's all, you're under, under these, this big black, this big black sort of upside down Philip Cox yeah. building. Oh, that's 2007, or eight, something like that. Big long space up there, pointed pointed in a particular direction for an axis. You could point it to let's point it to Brisbane tonight. So you, again, you make this thing that sort of can be, go anywhere, and you put all the art you put all the art and architecture up in here. But this is actually the fun part where you can actually sort of hang around. It's always raining in Venice, so you can stay dry, and you can, it's always cold in Venice, so you can have a fire. And there you go. There's the fire. You stand under there. If you're rich, you get a boat, I guess. Didn't win. I did win this one though. A competition for a a Ningal a re, well, ecological resort at Ningaloo, which is Exmouth on the Exmouth coast. And looking at the time, uh, this is the thing. This is there you go. This is this is this sort of ecological resort. Most resorts, as you know, particularly eco resorts, all about everybody being in their own little box, very separate. We thought the best thing about Ningaloo was the best thing about going anywhere is actually to bring people together, so we actually put all the rooms around this sort of thing. It was all, all based, a bit, built a bit like an oil rig. It had to have a, a swimming pool, partly because the absurdity of the competition organisers who sighted this thing three kilometres away from the best beaches in the world, and the three kilometres, the three kilometres of razor-sharp rocks, because this in fact used to be underwater a million years ago, and now the entire surface is covered with razor sharp rocks, so you can't even walk, you can't even walk to it. So you had to have a helicopter to get there. And it, so there was some irony there. But again, the, again, the rooms, the thing goes up and down against the landscape. So there's high rooms, low rooms, medium rooms, and it's on a place like that is pretty well. If you've been to Exmouth, apart from the beach, it's almost uninhabitable. It, uh, it was not almost uninhabitable. You know, 40, 45, 48 degree days. Uh, no water, entirely self-sufficient. So we ended up with, uh, again, ways of trying to occupy this sort of a, a territory, built in a place which is considered as part of a national park, so it had to be no intrusion on the site. So you had to build this. So he hence the, the oil rig response, where you can actually build a building effectively in parts, bring it up and put it together. You end up with this sort of a space of looking out over this uh, beautiful wasteland. Another competition. This is, again... A, a recent Venice Biennale project where, again, I think it's made into a catalogue, no, made into a diary, a desk diary, I think, rather than in, into an exhibition. Again, in response to the brief of how you might reconfigure Australian cities into the future, it was our, our belief that the cities are going to stay the same. The best you can do is probably just end up with little oases where things might happen and that uh, this stuff is actually beyond, beyond control, rightly so, as it's probably not too bad in terms of in terms of its ecological footprint by itself. And then lastly, I think this is lastly, a competition for a, a sculpture competition, a major sculpture for Perth. This is the major, called Situate, where, where the city of Perth wanted to spend a million dollars on public art. And so Perth, I'm not sure, a bit like Brisbane, I think your art's bigger than ours, Perth full of little things like this. Public art means... Little, little dinky things that actually cost a hell of a lot of money. We don't have things like that. We've got one like that. We've, there's one in Perth like that, but it's about this big. <laughs> so this was... I did this with the artist who I did those concrete panel houses for, and we thought we'd rather than give them very little art for a million dollars, we'd give them whatever it was, 200 tonnes of, of... um... 200 tonnes of structural steel spun into a... I guess a ring like that, which is, a, which is a, a, you know, above, above your head so you can actually walk through it and under it rather than actually have to sort of walk up, look at it and then, and then go away. Various things we were looking at at the time. This is, sorry, that slide. I had to find a slide. This is the winner, James Angus. I'm sorry, James. He was in fact, he's a West Australian, but he's now living elsewhere. This is the winner. Similar idea, except this thing is the size of a single carport and it's made of fiberglass, and that's what you get for a million dollars in the public art in, in the public art market. Whereas we thought 200 tonnes of structural steel produced by by uh, an architect, and I have to say there was a structural engineer 
on the project who'd, who'd uh, been working for Zaha did, we thought for a million dollars we could give them a lot of structural steel, whereas for a million dollars in art, you actually get, you get that. Now, currently I'm working on, uh, I guess I've called it the metaphor project, as you can imagine or see from some of the work. I'm very interested in sort of metaphors and the way architects conceive of their projects as being like other things. So these are some of the metaphors I'm interested in. Cookie cutters, weeds, trifle, rubbish, geology, atolls, battleships, and small world networks. So I've started trying to work through how some of these things might become a pattern book. I'm quite... As you can imagine, I'm quite interested in pattern books, 19th century pattern books, where you would see books that say, house for a gentleman of modest income, courthouse for a, you know, a shire. So the, the idea that you might be able to develop, I guess, typical typological pattern approaches to, to architecture, partly because as an academic, I don't have a lot of capacity to be able to actually realise projects. So they are really, in some sense, thought experiments. Well, they will have some, hopefully, value in the future. So the first one... If you remember, we talked about speed. This is, I think, Grant Hackett, but it was, it was it Ian Thorpe. I'm sorry, I'm not a, it's one of those guys. This is what's happened now, though, where rather than speed, the latest we'll talk now is about, like, more about obesity than speed. So this is a scheme, I imagine, for a, a museum or a, a cultural building in, a, in an urban environment where you might have, well, I imagine you might have a, a very rational sort of grid of columns and then this sort of bulging, a bulging uh, facade of, of uh, anything you like to actually contain all the sort of art or the goodies that belong inside cultural buildings. So this can be over, this is the public, there's bars, cafes, a bit like the stuff that's all along the river here, in here, little doors, cafes, and then you go outside and this is actually where the special stuff is, where art is, where culture is. Forests, another one. Big open spaces, airports, shopping centres, cultural, you know, all those sort of great big commercial spaces that we spend our lives in. I guess it seems to me that, you know, I'm trying to be looking at the idea of a, some sort of abstract forest where you have sort of a rational grid, a bit like a plantation where they line the trees up, and then you have sort of a dummy grid, a bit like Louis Kahn. If you remember those little drawings of that particular house, I can't remember which one it was, with the, the line with the trees on one side and the other. Uh, so you end up with effectively a sort of a, you know, there's an elevation where you get this sort of, all this sort of drooping ceilings, which end up being a bit in, inside a bit like this, and outside will just be inside a big box. This one, this one's not, this is, I, I thought about a shish kebab, and we've got a very famous shish kebab, there's a very famous version of this in Perth by, which I won't talk about, there's one in Sydney, you've got the, the best one of this at the moment. This one's more like a camshaft at the moment, so that one's not really successful. So conclusions, to try and get back to where we started. The title of the talk, Towards a New Architecture, Towards a Two and a Quarter Dimensional Architecture. This is the, you know, Cabousier, 1923, I think. Architecture is the masterly correct and magnificent play of masses brought together in life. Uh, remember, Gideon... Gideon drove architecture down that pathway. Architecture's never had someone like a John Berger who's actually seriously looked at the way a dis discipline of architecture works. We're worse for it. We've had a Robert Venturi. We've had a Frank Gehry, I guess. Once someone did that, anything's possible. <laughs> but look, Bunnings, this is, this is good. This is West Australia. We invented this. Or West Farmers did. I think they have Bunnings in here, over here now. They've actually got, don't bother with the sign now, just paint it on here. And then when you've done that, you can turn it into the logo. So, in some sense, my point for this evening is to try and you know, suggest that the future for me in architecture is to go from three dimensions towards two. Ashton Rag McDougall. Two, I think I said that first article, 2.7. Gideon's talking about four. Oh. I'm much more interested in two, hence two and a quarter. I guess the other thing I'm very interested in is the sense of location. The grass is greener, certainly greener in Melbourne. The water's even, you know, even Venice, the water's even green. But for me, I guess I've always tried to, in my work, understand 
the particular place where I've actually had the pleasure to work in for the last 25 years. You need rogues coloured glasses. I finally found where that came from. I think, you know, Google quote, or I don't know how you find these things, but anyway, that's where they come from. Remarkable has a, such an architectural context for its origins as a phrase. You kind of need rose coloured glasses in Perth for lots of reasons, the sun particularly. And indeed, when I did that catalogue back in, of Gordon Finn of Armadale, I indeed reproduced all the images in this sort of strange rose coloured glasses. For better or worse, I guess, you know, I love Perth. That's the title, I guess, of a book I'm doing with Richard Weller to try and actually explain the particularities of Perth in architecture so that I can tell some of these stories that um, other people might, in fact, find in the book on their coffee table in their nice hotel room in Grey Street. Well, not Grey Street. In our case, it'll be St George's Terrace. Now, I'm, I'm keeping doing things like this. I've just done an exhibition of another architect... For, uh, who's actually still alive, <laughs> but he's 85, so I'm hoping that he won't follow the patterns of the rest. But anyway, a, a fabulous architect who designed you know, this particular five-sided you know, five church in 1959 that Rainer Bannon thought was the sort of most amazing, amazingly provocative Catholic church designed you know, at that time, pre-Vatican II. But I guess my work, what I've tried to hopefully convey tonight is very much about location and location and location. A couple of thank yous. My students, much of this work has been developed with my, working through my students. This is again a project for an art gallery with a student some years ago. So most of the work I've done or people have helped me, ideas I've developed have come through working with students. Other architects, I guess my peers are other architects. So in this case, it's a Jackson Clements Burroughs scheme in that Tape 7 book for a, a particularly exciting reworking of the double-sided, you know, double-loaded apartment building, which they're endeavouring to work on. And thank you to UWA, where I've had the great pleasure to work for the last 25 years, who have been very supportive of my, of my work as an architect and as an academic. Now, the question... Now, this is contemporary art. Remember, Gideon wanted us to go down the Corbusier path. This is, what art, this is what artists do now. This is actually a thing called the Tissue Culture and Art Project. A group of UWA artists working inside an anatomy department are now sort of growing tissue and art. And the Museum of Modern Art has actually purchased this particular piece as they continually are exploring the sort of space between, I guess, what is art and what might it be in its relationship to, to ourselves. So if I had to give an answer to, you know, what is the future for architecture, it would be that. And again, it comes from one of the quotes from the pieces from Venice that I had up before. As you're seeing a malignant melanoma, which I hope you can all recognise, as uh, what they actually look like as they uh, proliferate. But uh, that would be my answer. And effectively why, I think... In terms of that number, two, three, four, or five, I think my, my own view is that it, it needs to, we need to get much closer to two than to four. So, thank you for the opportunity to come up here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, this will be a bit of a roundabout one, but I, I think the thing that strikes me about West Australia is the fly-in, fly-out business. Mm. Queensland's the most decentralised state, so as you go up the coast, before there was any north-south rail, there were a series of, of links going inland mm. from you know, Rockhampton, Townsville, Gladstone, Cairns, etc. The thing that really strikes me in, is West Australia is really only Perth and the bush. You know, I was amazed to go to Kununurra to see people getting on a plane to fly something like 3,000 kilometres home after a fortnight's work, you know, whereas they could fly 800, 800 k's to Darwin or, or 600 k's to, to, um, to Broome. So th there's this very strange situation where the, a complete dislocation of work and living occurs. And... And I, I really wonder what that means for Perth. In, in, a, in Queensland, 
the miners that are in central Queensland quite often live at Zilzi or Yapoon. They drive 600 kilometres and their family is at the beach and they have this life between the mine and the coast. But in Perth, there's this huge dislocation. So what does that mean for people that are living in Perth that are part of the family of, the, of these fly and fly out miners? And, and is, there, is there something unique about the, the kind of living that they need to do or the way in which they survive in between the, 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 the visits? I mean, it, it just strikes to me that it's, it's the most bizarre pattern of living or creating a city in the world today. I guess I try not to take any, or make any value judgments about how people live. And if you look at some of the demographics of clients that I've worked with or the way people actually now live, I mean, uh, so in that sense, I, I, mean, I don't really see it as an issue. I mean, if people want to fly to work three or 4,000 miles and then fly home, that's fine. If they want to go and work on an oil rig for $300,000 and then spend their money on whatever they spend their money on. I, don't, I, mean, I, I guess I've never seen architects' role as being a, a, a particularly interested in you know, modifying rather than responding to a particular social need. Yeah, life's fragmented, that's right. Yeah, life's fragmented, so you end up with you know, fragmented houses, I guess. Or people have more than one. Or, but uh, I, I, I've never seen architects' role as being trying to you know, establish a way of living rather than trying to support the way people, the way people really want to live. They want to live out of a suitcase. I mean, the house, the, the little house that was in Naga River for the, the, the little tiny courtyard house, I mean, that's a case of, a, I think he's probably 40 now. Uh, he's never, never even rented or owned a house. He's lived in a, he's lived in a, in a combi van and a suitcase. And he's 40 and he's just trying to grapple with the idea of, you know, even building a house. And he can't. He, he keeps flying off. So he, he'll, he, works, he goes to work on, like, on an oil rig off Sakhalin, you know, for three months, then he'll fly to a, he'll fly to India and do a meditation course. And then he ended up, then he actually got a Japanese girlfriend and bought some land in Sapporo. And then, then he had an instant family, so he went cool for a year or two. Then they split up. That was after meditation or before, I can't remember. And then he comes back into his combi little van. And so his life is in a, you know, it's a suitcase. So to build anything for him is going to be difficult. And I've done that house about three or four times. It'll probably never. It'll probably never get built because he'll never settle down. And, he, and his brief was, you know, he wants to be able to, you know, do that, but he wants to then have a, you know, a massive four-wheel drive with a jet ski, and he wants, you know, he wants, you know, it's all the trimmings as well. So it's a strange combination of, sort of and he wants to be able to see the surf break. So it's all about, yeah, it's just how people live. Mm. Mm. It still has a character. It's always going to have a character. Everywhere, everywhere has character. So I don't... I mean, Perth had a, a particular character in the, let's say, the 1890s and the 1970s, and then the, now it's got another character now. But I don't think any one of those characters is particularly, is particularly more important or more appropriate than the rest. It's just going to... Not being maintained. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I'm not a great believer in maintaining anything other than what people want to do. So, hence the comment about heritage. I mean, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a great critic of the notion of heritage legislation or heritage controls or anything with heritage. To me, you know, people don't keep Shafter Cathedral because it's, there's some rule, you know, some law that says you cannot touch this. People actually keep that because it's actually worth keeping in its own right. So, in some sense, intrinsic value. So, I'd much rather than having to then debate values, I'd rather just allow people to value things on their intrinsic worth. Simon, I want to ask a bit about, about housing. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I very much enjoyed your sort of debunking uh, anti-aesthetic, mm. um, anti-formal mm. approach in your description of housing. But um, I guess underlying that is another kind of question about the return of housing questions in architecture. Because I guess for most of the last 30 years, the big questions of housing that were, rose in the 60s have faded and housing's become a kind of luxury commodity, I guess, mm. in the way that I think that you're um, trying to poke a mm. bit of fun at. Mm. But what do you think the prospects are now for a realistic debate on housing to return, the, the kind of attitudes that you're bringing to your individual projects about a generic approach to housing, about uh, possible housing types, about relationship of housing to urban form? Do you think those kinds of explorations that you're making in particular projects are going to have a, a bigger audience from now on as they're kind of the institutional and 
governmental and economic framework that those questions might return in a big mm -hmm. way? Well, but, I, I, but you're always going to get people who will, you know, crave, you know, form and craft, you know, and lots of times there's good, good places for it, I mean, you know, cultural expression, a place like a library, you can imagine there's a level of, a level of commitment to form and craft, let's say. But historically, it's still very modest. If you compare, let's say, this library to a 19th century library, and you compare them against the sort of economic circumstances of the time, you have to say that we are spending less and less on, on culture. And my own view is that's actually a good thing, because we're spending more and more on medical research, let's say. In terms of housing, no, people are still going to want, with, with affluence or with uh, circumstance, they will crave you know, the gold leaf picture frame around the oil painting, you know, like John Berger, Marcel Duchamp. My, you know, I guess the question is, do I think that we're going to get to a stage where people will uh, not? I, I, my own view is I think they are already. I think people are increasingly now uh, able to you know, disconnect commodification from, well, let's say, you know, functionality. I think it's come through sustainability, the notion that products, things you do, actually matter now. So I think the, and I haven't talked about sustainability, I actually rubbed it out, it was one of the slides, because I think this interest in, you know, the future of the world, either through population or through running out of oil or through greenhouses, actually uh, will be, I hope, this, a, a major sort of funnel through which we might get significant changes in, let's say, you know, housing policy or housing product. So I, as I, I'm, I'm typically I'm very optimistic about, about both you know, the general house, but also, I guess, architecture generally. And we might, in, in the future, I mean, you know, the great things would be, would be, you know, whether it's this Bunnings warehouse, it'll just say, you know, Art Gallery of Queensland. It would be fabulous. You know, that, to me, would be, you know, if you could actually end up with... And it's, getting, it's actually getting there, I think. If you have a look at what art galleries used to be, have a look at what art used to be, we're getting to the stage where the art gallery of Queensland is going to be like a bunning store. And to me, that would be a great thing. So Robert Venturi, I am a monument, will be, you know, art gallery of Queensland on it. So I think it actually is happening. It's just, unfortunately, architecture, urban design, cities, they take a long time to move. Hence, you know, 25 years ago, in my mind, you know, that bit of Brisbane... Hasn't, hasn't changed much. There's a couple of, you know, baubles, but it doesn't change. It takes a long time. And in, again, architecture in Australia, it's been a long, slow path. We're only just beginning to actually, I think, understand how to actually live here and how, how to actually occupy this place. Hence, you get a marvellous space like this, you know. This, the, the greatest thing about this building, I think, is that sort of, you know, way you can actually be outside. Next week we have uh, a lecture by the Tokyo-based architect Go Hasegawa.